questions at the end um, when we get to it. So I am going to share my screen and we can get started. You know, and I'm one thing I'm thinking too, since we do have a lot of people that don't need this kind of level is that we can have a whole discussion about, is this a good way to talk about all of this for the, you know, the younger, newer people in our, in our firms, so. Yeah, that's a great idea, Wendy. Yeah. And to get people encouraged to work in the field, yeah. All right, so I could jump right in. The work. So I just wanted to start, since we do have some new new faces here, um, I just wanted to encourage anyone that after this presentation, if you're super excited about the Healthcare Facilities Committee and uh, healthcare design, and you wanna get more involved, please reach out. Um, and we will get you on the mailing list for any future events. Um, they don't do the same email blast that they used to do. So um, just send any of the three of us, uh, Cindy or myself or Brayden, who's our secretary for the committee, um, an email and we'll get you to the list or you can follow us on LinkedIn um, and we will post every event that we're doing you know, a couple weeks beforehand. So this is our speaker tonight. So I'll hand it off to Wendy. Hi, Wendy Weitzner. I know some of you, but not all of you. I am a partner with the Innova Group. Uh, we are a strategic planning company that focuses on strategy and the intersection with healthcare facilities. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Braden Reed. I'm a healthcare architect with NDBJ. Um, we're an architecture firm. <laughs> a lot of our practice is healthcare, I guess, um, but we do other sectors as well. Uh, my name is Maylee. I am a senior associate uh, project manager at Payette. I have been in healthcare for 15 years um, and with Payette for almost six. I'm Andrew Brumbach, uh, architect and planner, and I lead, lead the healthcare group for the Smith Group office in Boston. So these are our uh, learning objectives, the you know required AIA um, learning objectives. So we're going to start off kind of talking about kind of basic facility implications of healthcare business drivers, moving into looking at the facility, thinking about access points, internal flows, um, how they relate to patient safety and operational efficiency. Um, Begin to evaluate major design decisions to balance you know, the technical requirements and also the occupant well-being, um, and then look at kind of the importance of healthcare facilities in our communities and especially in relationship to resilience. So this is our agenda, pretty much aligned with what I said. Uh, so we're gonna start off with the business of healthcare, move into some basic regulations and resources, then kind of take um, an outside in look, you know, looking at the site, all of the access points, then doing more of an inside out, looking at the component parts, um, and then kind of moving on to where we see healthcare right now and in the near term future. Off to Wendy. All right, so I'm going to start about the business of healthcare, and that even just on the nomenclature of what do we even mean by healthcare, and typically, especially for the folks that are presenting and a lot of people in this uh, virtual room, when we're saying healthcare, we're thinking about healthcare providers. But um, there are other parts of the of the healthcare continuum, including payers and pharma and devices and um, public health and federal stuff. And uh, but today we're really talking about the provider piece. And uh, within providers, a lot of times people automatically think about hospitals. Uh, and a lot of the folks here do a lot of work on hospitals. But there's also physician groups. There's the post acute. Um, like skilled nursing, rehab, uh, nursing homes component. And then there's also the entire ancillary service business where some of these services like surgery and imaging are in hospitals, but there are also providers that offer just these services typically on an outpatient basis. So just to give a little bit of context. And um, this, in the providers, there's a you know this continuum of care of what's happening first in the community and outpatient kinds of things up to the most complex acute care down to the post-acute. This is, um, some of you might be familiar with a company called SG2, and this is one of their a version of one of their standard uh, images that just shows this entire continuum and that there are all these other things besides the hospital in the healthcare provider uh, component with the hospitals being the most expensive, most complex, 
but a career in healthcare architecture, you could possibly do this without ever working on a hospital. Um, and where does actually the healthcare dollar go? And it relates in, in a way to that image that you just saw is on the left, uh, you can see that only 30% of the healthcare dollar actually goes to hospitals. <laughs> And uh, the rest is going to physician services and to medical equipment and nursing homes and home health. And then even within the hospital of that, um, the revenues or costs going there, about half of their revenues are outpatient. And then how does it get paid? Uh, and this is an important part of the healthcare business and is somewhat a driver in a way, in this in the next slide about why we build what we build and that about 35, 40% of payment to healthcare or to hospitals actually is commercial insurance, which is most of what we probably have. Um, with Medicare and Medicaid, Medicare being the payment for typically folks over 65, but there are other people who qualify for that. And Medicaid, people typically at a lower income, um, making up uh, almost 40% of payments. So we think of ourselves as a private health system, but in fact, um, majority of the payments to hospitals are through public sources. And um, how are hospitals paid? And this has got a little more detail that you want, but that uh, it is important again to how we think about what's gonna go in a hospital or uh, an outpatient facility. And that's that Traditionally and still predominantly, healthcare providers are paid on what's called a fee for service model, meaning for every encounter they provide, they get paid, just like us, essentially. You know, for every project we do, um, we get paid. And so um, the health systems are generally incentivized to have more volume. Um, more encounters, just like we're incentivized to design more buildings or um, do more strategic planning projects. And so there isn't a lot of incentive to actually reduce the demand for care um, because you're paid to provide care. <laughs> so the emerging and some organizations have already been this way, but um, the emerging way to get paid, and it's and it's a big piece of strategy and thinking about how, where things go, is called value-based care, where instead um, you're paid more for outcomes um, than for volume. And uh, for 20 years, we've been worried about how much this is going to change what we need to do as a in a, in a strategy and the types of buildings. Um, we keep saying, thinking any day now, everything's going to be value-based care. Um, and we're still saying any day now, things are going to be value-based care. <laughs> um, and that matters because especially in the fee-for-service model, um, hospital profitability is generally determined by the payer mix, meaning the types of uh, payment, commercial versus Medicaid, and the service. So um, if you remember that pie graph, a whole lot of the care is through the public payers, um, and they actually typically pay less than it actually costs for the hospitals or providers to offer the care. And so it's made up for by commercial insurances, which pay above. And so a lot of work that we do um, is around, unfortunately, <laughs> for people who have public paying is we're trying to figure out where's a good location and how do we get more commercial insurance? Because without the commercial insurance at the current structure, hospitals cannot survive. They need to have commercial insurance under the fee-for-service model um, where they, they don't just don't have enough revenue to cover their costs. And the same thing happens on services. So certain services are much more profitable in how they're paid on a fee-for-service basis, cardiac, neuro, et cetera, paying a lot more. And so if any of you've worked on hospitals and you're probably like, oh, Wendy and her strategic planners, they always tell us the same thing, you know, ortho, neuro, cardiac, and oncology. And that's because those are the things that <laughs> generally make money. Um, and so it's, 
common that that's a big part of the strategy. Um, and this could and should change somewhat um, under a more fee for value. The other piece is just understanding about how doctors, because the doctors are you know, the major providers of the care, um, and but they are often a separate entity. Um, sometimes they're employed. So hospitals employ about 40% of the physician groups. Um, that's the pie graph on the right. And um, the physicians themselves or third parties like private equity um, own the remaining. And that becomes an issue as we're planning both strategy and facilities is that if the physicians, who those are the ones that bring in the work and do the work at the hospital, you know, if you don't have the physicians, there's nobody coming to your hospital. Um, and they are not all the time employed by you and you're competing strategically for physicians to want to differentially use your hospital versus others in the market. Um, and that also in the doctors that a lot of them are primary care, um, but the other half are specialty. So the other piece that's happening and it relates both to technology, but also more importantly to these potentially changing payment systems is uh, a site of care shift. So a lot of services that have traditionally occurred at a hospital location are able to move to an outpatient location um, either because the regulators or payers like Medicare say they will allow it to be, meaning they'll pay for it to happen outside of a hospital, or increasingly, they say we will only pay for it outside of a hospital because doing it in a hospital is too expensive. And so you're seeing a lot of work in the market around uh, urgent care, ambulatory surgery centers, outpatient imaging, um, because primarily because of the payment model, but it's also now at least supported by technology and that you can safely get a lot of care, not in the hospital setting. Um, but still what's in a hospital, this is, you know, again, for the 101 folks is the typical things that you're working on in terms of a design is that there's inpatient beds, there's an emergency department, um, there's interventional services like operating rooms and things that are like operating rooms, but you're not opening the people up instead of you're using a catheter to uh, like a, a straw <laughs> to look inside people's veins. Um, there's a mix of what we call diagnostic and treatment services like testing and rehab and dialysis and imaging and lab. Um, there are often outpatient services or physician clinics in a hospital or near a hospital. Um, and then a lot of the stuff that happens in the basement, uh, the logistical support services, food, maintenance, materials management, and as well as administration. And from a master planning or architecture perspective, there's always the question about how much of this administrative stuff actually needs to be in the hospital or can be in a lower <laughs> cost, less, com less complex building. Thanks, Wendy. Um, so... You know, I think when people think about healthcare design, they think about a lot of, you know, very strict regulations and technical requirements. And that's very true. There are a lot of technical requirements in healthcare design. But with that, there's also a lot of really good resources and guidelines um, for the design, which can help be kind of your jumping off point as you're looking at a healthcare project. So um, this is the Facility Guidelines Institute or FGI. Um, and these kind of become the, you know, the Bible to uh, what to a healthcare designer and a healthcare planner as you're looking about what you're required to have in the space, how big your rooms need to be, um, what is required to be in the room. Um, and they're broken down into hospitals, outpatient facilities, and then those residential um, facilities and supportive care afterwards. So aligning with the continuum of care that Wendy was outlining before. Um, and these are guidelines that different states adopt and they adopt them similar to any other type of code by the year. Um, so the Massachusetts is right now on FGI 2018, 2022 is out and some states are following that. I know Connecticut just recently adopted 2022. There are some states that are still using 2010. So um, you have to know which jurisdiction you're in as you're looking at it, but they do, and they do change, not a ton, but there are incremental changes every couple of years. Uh, as I said, Massachusetts has adopted uh, 2018, and luckily for us, they've done 
done the hard work of turning these into checklists, which are really helpful. It's a lot easier to navigate these over the, the full FGI books. Um, it's broken down by department type, and you can utilize these to kind of walk through each program um, of your facility that you're working on um, and really learn what you're required to have. Um, it's all online. You can access it. It's broken down once again in between inpatient versus outpatient um, facilities. Um, as I said, that we're on 2018. So if you wanted to utilize these for another state, they are available, but you would have to just cross-reference and make sure that any changes aren't different as you're looking at um, other states. Um, some other resources that uh, you can utilize to kind of learn more about healthcare. This is sort of the, the next level of development, but learning about best practices and um, any research that's been going on. These are two great resources. Um, you know, it'll somewhat depend on where you work and what if your firm has access to these, but um, there are some things anyone can get, but there's other things that you need to have uh, kind of a login for. But one is the advisory board. So this is um, you know, it's actually a conglomeration of healthcare entities and they give us as consultants access to some of the things that they have, but it's, you know, you can get webinars, there's daily briefings, blogs, research, um, a lot of great data tool sets to kind of test out things um, and look at the, begin to do a really low level of what uh, Wendy does for a living to just kind of get yourself a baseline of what's going on in the marketplace. Um, and then there's also the Center for Health Design, and this is really geared towards that healthcare research. Um, so this, there's a great knowledge repository. Um, they have, you know, check. They have their own types of checklists, um, other webinars and workshops that you can learn more about um, healthcare design and health, the latest in healthcare research. And then with that, part of them is heard. So this is sort of that white paper journal um, database that they have available, so you can see what the latest is as you're beginning any project. So expanding on that, you can actually get specific certifications in, um, in evidence-based design as part of the Center for Health Design. So this is really thinking of the design process as just as much sort of an iterative creative process as also a research process. So thinking of how you are testing things in your projects, getting baseline data and following up later on and contributing to all of that research. Um, going forward so that we can really grow and align with evidence-based medicine, evidence-based design. Um, the other one, other certification that you can get as a healthcare architect is the American College of Healthcare Architects or ACA. Um, and this is really geared towards people who have kind of dedicated their careers to um, healthcare architecture. You, you're, there's an expectation that you're in it for a number of years. You have to do a test in a portfolio to get this um, certification, but just know that there are extra levels of expertise and certification that you can get if you decide to kind of go down the path of healthcare architecture. Hand it off to Braden. All right, thanks, Andrew. Um, so for those of you on the call who are new to architecture, um, you, you're probably gathering from everything Wendy and Andrew just went over that healthcare is very complicated um, and I would say the same is true probably for the seasoned professionals who have established healthcare careers. You probably also appreciate how complicated healthcare architecture is. And we haven't even gone inside a building yet. So <clears throat> what I'm going to try and do is um, break down the kind of four major ways we think about healthcare design when we're starting a new project. Um, and I'm going to try and draw parallels between a more simple form of architecture, which is a single family house. Um, because some of the fundamental elements are similar, um, and I think maybe that's a good sort of uh, analogous way to appreciate, um, you know, tackling the, the huge complex problem that is a healthcare project. So, so the first thing we'll talk about is how do you get, how do you get into the building? So in a house, um, generally speaking, there are two major kind of ways to approach a house. Um, in this case, I'm showing a single family house that has a garage. So you might drive up to the house uh, from the street, or you might walk up to the front door from the sidewalk. Um, so it's 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 pretty, pretty simple. Uh, I live in South Boston, so I actually just have one way you get into my house. You just walk up to the front door. In a hospital, there are six kind of main ways we think about um, flows circulating to a hospital building. 
So the first one is, is the main entry circulation. So that's when you're dropping somebody off for an appointment or going to visit somebody that might be um, admitted to the hospital. So this is kind of a main like drop off loop that you try and keep separate from everything else. The other one is uh, an emergency department drop off loop. So that we try and always keep those two flows separate. And because the nature of when you approach uh, a hospital to go to the ED might be more kind of stressful and frenetic, you generally you don't want those two flows to cross one another because that could be problematic. Um, within the ED, there's also another way in, and that is for the ambulance. So the ambulance and the, the ED drop off, we try and further keep those separate. Um, then you typically have a loading dock. That's where all of the supplies, equipment, everything for the hospital comes and goes. You also, it's not always the case, but often the case you have separate staff circulation because um, for every sort of three or four staff parking spots, there might be one par public parking spot. So the staff vastly outnumber generally visitors to a hospital. Um, and then the sixth sort of fun complex way is you might have a helicopter that lands either on top of the hospital or on the ground somewhere nearby. So you can see it's sort of, it's vastly more kind of complicated, the, the site planning considerations you have to take when you're looking at a, a hospital building. So then when we kind of get closer up to the envelope of, of the building in a house, you might, in, a, in the same kind of single family house context, you might have like four doors in the house. So you might have the front door and that's generally sort of nicely framed and it, maybe it has a, an awning or some kind of portico to sort of welcome you. You also may have a garage door if you are if you live in Boston and you're fortunate, um, <laughs> you might have a garage door. Um, on that garage, there might be a back door that's just another swing door that you can walk in. And then maybe you have a side door, which is, you know, where your friend comes over to like play video games after school or something. In a hospital, it's it's similar. The, the way you think about those entries is very similar. So in that kind of main entry, that's again, that's where most of the sort of members of public come to the hospital and enter the hospital. So the way we design that and treat that is similar to in a house. You generally want that to be kind of a more grand entrance. It generally has like a covered awning so that you don't get wet if it's raining or snowing or, you know, all the same sort of way you might design uh, the main entry to a house, you would probably take a similar approach to a hospital. The emergency department is similar. Um, again, that's kind of like the side door to the hospital, but it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, same thing for the ambulance entrance. Uh, the loading dock is very similar to the garage in this particular hospital. It's below grade, so you drive down a ramp and you kind of go into the building so that it's sort of visibly, physically separate from everything else. The staff entry, the back door is very similar to the kind of back door into the garage. And, and this is sort of generally speaking, like how you think about the entries into a hospital as being analogous to the entries into a house. Um, so the other the other way we think about uh, healthcare is is the way a building is stacked. So basically, that's all the kind of layers of different floors and program. How how do they all sort of work together based on um, adjacencies, uh, based on things that need views or windows, based on one particular department that might feed the whole hospital. So there's a lot of different you know, ways to think about it in a kind of like taking a slice through the hospital. So in a house, if you think about the same single family house, on the top of the house, you probably will put the bedrooms, you know, those that's a quieter space where you don't um, you don't socialize as much. And you know, if you go to sleep, there's nobody above you making noise if they're still awake. Um, the main kind of social functions are on that ground floor your living room, kitchen, dining, they're all kind of contiguous. And then maybe in the basement, you, maybe you have another bedroom and you know a utility room that kind of serves the whole house. So in a hospital, it's, it's also some similar principles, but vastly more complicated. So in this particular um, example, there's these two towers and each of those towers, I'm so sorry if you hear crying, my, my daughter just got home from school um, and she's hungry, I guess. So, so you have uh, inpatient beds in each of these towers and all of those beds need windows 
And generally it's advantageous for them to have views. So it makes sense for those to kind of go, you know, up higher in the building. Um, they're served from the, the above and below via, you know, very robust mechanical systems. Um, and then when you kind of go below that into what we call the podium of the hospital, then you have all these other different layers of functions. Some of them, these, these ambulatory clinics, people just kind of come and go for a quick appointment and they leave. Um, for the procedural areas, they may come, have their procedure done, and then they might go up into one of the um, inpatient beds. So, so again, some of the kind of principles relative to residential architecture are similar, um, but with many more sort of layers of consideration and, uh, and connectivity required. So, so then the other thing we think about when we're looking again in like a floor plan view is how adjacencies work. And you would do the same thing if you were planning a house. So in this, in this example, this um, architect who does these what he calls plan attacks. He dissects a floor plan that's not very well laid out and points out kind of all the deficiencies of it and then reorganizes things so that it's more efficient, it's sort of better designed, it's more functional. And, you know, we do the same thing in healthcare architecture. So in this case, the on the, on the bad side, um, <laughs> sorry, Andrew, on the bad side, you know, you have a bedroom that's like right off of your family room. And basically the whole of the dining room is circulation to get into the family room and through the kitchen. So you don't really have a place for a dining table. So, you know, in, in sort of like shuffling the pieces around, he's reorganized it so that you can actually use the dining room. The kitchen sort of has a more appropriate location and size and flow. And so you can go to the next slide, Andrew, sorry. So we do the same thing in architecture. We think um, the emergency department uses this department we call imaging, which is where your CAT scans and your uh, x-ray rooms and ultrasounds and everything are, there's a lot of traffic between those two things. And in the clinical support side, maybe you have a, a lab or something, the lab feeds the emergency department. Um, the administrative space might have doctor's offices that kind of go to, you know, all of the adjacent clinical spaces. So it's the same sort of approach of like thinking, what's the best location for all of these pieces um, that sort of gets to be a very efficient floor plan that's also functional um, that, you know, kind of checks like numerous different boxes. And so the final level of consideration, which I think is, is very difficult to draw a parallel in, in a single family home, but you probably could do it, but I didn't do it here. And it's, it's where we think about like the, probably the most complicated element of healthcare design, and that's the flows. So there's this idea of these seven flows of architecture. And there, so there are these like seven criteria of, of different entities, uh, equipment, information, and things that all sort of work their way through a hospital. Um, and if you go to the next slide, Andrew. So basically, I've attempted to just sort of like map out just a few of them, for example, that might happen on that same floor plan. And you can say like, Someone might come into the emergency department. They might need to go get a scan and imaging. They might need to have their blood drawn. That blood sample goes down to the lab. A doctor has to analyze their results. Like there's a lot, there's a lot going on. And so this is where I think all of it, all of these sort of multi dimensions of uh, design considerations and constraints and codes and everything like really comes together when you start to think about how, how all the departments work together. So. So that's a quick, I think I took one breath there, but that's a quick kind of <laughs> overview of some of the design considerations. Um, and I'll pass it on to Maylene and we'll go deeper inside the building. Yeah. So um, I'm going to focus on the inside of the building now that Braden's done an excellent job of getting us there. Uh, Andrew talked about code. We, you know, you have FGI, you have DPH, and you do have local requirements. Uh, for example, you know, Pennsylvania follows uh, the FGI guidelines, except for their well baby nursery, which follows a, you know, mother's and infants book that's not even code. So it's it's kind of relative to the state that you live in. Um, and then it's also defined by users being the staff and the visitors and the family advisory committees. And that's based on, you know, what do they need programmatically? How do they want their facility to flow and function? And then what is their care model? So how all those pieces fit together, you can either end up with something that's a little bit more like a minotaur maze, 
or you can end up with something that just really sings and fits and everything flows beautifully. So, thanks. So this is an example of something that you would find in the FGI guidelines. Um, don't get overwhelmed by this. Uh, once you start to break it down, you start to see that it's actually really well defined on what you need in a room. Um, and the nice thing about this is it, while it does leave some questions still and there's some room for interpretation, it does not design the space for you. So a common misconception in healthcare is that we just don't get to design anything. And that's 100% not true. So if you take these qualifications that you see on the screen, you know, it has to have 325 square feet of clear floor area. That means you can't have any fixed casework there, fixed furniture or fixed equipment. That's just open space or things that are movable or open underneath a hand washing sink. Um, minimum clear width of the 13 feet at the head wall that has to do with the amount of people that are going to be up there, the amount of medical gases that it needs to accommodate. So it's really just making sure that this space, there's enough space in this room for all of the action that is going to take place in an LDR. Um, and then also, you know, the 40 square feet of clear space for the exam space for the baby to make sure that there's enough room for staff to come in and make sure the baby is okay. So if you go to the next slide. You can kind of start to see how all of this lays out. So it's not as daunting once you start to put those pieces together in kind of a very organized fashion, you know, and you can even see it on the on the screen on the left side. The you you come in, you can wash your hands, you've got a little bit of storage space, then you have the uh, baby's exam space, followed by the labor and delivery kind of charting area, the labor and delivery bed, the healthy baby. Uh, bassinet. And then along the window, you have the family zone. So what it does is it goes from get yourself clean, more acute to less acute. So that's, that's kind of how it's organized so that everything that needs to happen immediately, people can get out of each other's way and then they can leave. So that's, that's how this is really organized. And the FGI is actually really helpful for that. Um, just kind of taking some of that stress of what am I supposed to do off of your plate? Okay. Um, and then this is how the puzzle piece fits in, fits into the pie. Um, that's the labor and delivery room I showed on the left corner here, but it's also on the, the grander scheme of things, as Braden was talking about, you have the flow of the floor. So you have the flow of po postpartum, that's where mothers go once they've had their children. You have the antepartum along the bottom that has a straight shot into labor and delivery that's private and also into the C-section in case they need to have an emergency C-section. And the labor and delivery is just kind of on its own um, with the triage area as well, okay? So the user experience is something that we hear about a lot, patient satisfaction, um, patient comfort, staff, um, everything. So this is something that's become very important in our design. So if you go to the next slide. And this is what we're used to seeing in movies and probably unfortunately some of the facilities that we are in because this is what we used to do. And um, the one on the left is an example of a psychiatric board from a movie <laughs> um, and it's cold and it's sterile and it's there's there's nothing in it to comfort you and to calm you and to make you feel at home. It's just very cold and rigid. <clears throat> um, and then the image on the right is just an old hospital. I think it's a VA hospital and it just it's just not anywhere you would want to be. So next slide. So the types of things that we think about when it comes to user experience and designing for that are um, areas of respite, which is a place um, to just take a moment. These facilities can be very, very stressful for staff and for family. So it's a place for them to just step back, take a breath. Sometimes they need to cry. Sometimes they just need to be alone. Um, and then they can just go back to work the way that they need to. Um, views to nature, and this everybody loves views to nature, but it's also been proven that views to nature help um, help heal and help get patients um, on the road to recovery faster. Um, color and art. Um, there is an entire thesis that we can write on color in healthcare architecture. Um, there's been several architect articles written on this. Um, for the purposes of this, I, I'm going to talk about color in, in terms of wayfinding um, and livening up the space. So, um, so here's an example of an area of respite. It doesn't need to be, you know, a, a hidden corner. It can just be a space that somebody can sit down and turn and look out of a window while somebody goes by, but they feel sheltered, they feel safe, they feel comfortable. Okay. Um, 
more for areas of respite and how do we think about this as we're moving up a building and what the patient population is like and what the staff population is like. So what you're seeing on the left is it, you know, places for children to play um, and we start to map things like that up the building so that that's available on every floor. And then we can actually start to build that in so that people can find their way around the building based on these things that they're seeing. Okay. Uh, views to nature. Uh, this is, as I said, one of the most important things um, to us. And in the ginormous hospitals that we see that have been built over years and years and years and years and years, they, if they were smart, and most of them have been, they have either created green spaces within their little puzzle pieces, or they're working on doing that now, or as they went, they left openings to do this. Um, and it, it can be accessible or it can just be visual. Um, it's something that you could just walk by and just have a moment or, you know, down on the lower left, it's something that you can, you can enter. Okay. So color and art. Um, so this is something that for the units that we're designing, we try and, you know, make it lively or make it calm or make it feel something better than a cold, sterile hospital. Uh, so this is an example of something that has been done for a women's health unit and that they picked the theme of flowers, so they would put flowers everywhere, and we kind of started to pick colors from that, uh, that the users liked, that because they felt that it made them feel better. Now, the users that we spoke to in this situation were the nurses, um, so they, you know, they really played a, a huge role in the decision making for this, um, and then the, the bottom one is for the NICU. Uh, which is the neonatal intensive care unit. So this is a very stressful unit. This is where sick babies go. Um, and how can we make the, the families feel better? The colors are calm. There are certain colors that you have to avoid in a NICU uh, because they can actually change the color of the baby under the light. So, <laughs> um, but the, the, your users will tell you that. So this isn't something you have to go in and know if you pick the color, like, no, don't use that. So it's it's kind of nice. And we went with the nest theme for that because you know, to make the, the babies and their mothers feel good. Wayfinding is one of the most difficult things in, in the hospital, as I am sure every single one of you is aware of on this call. If you have been to any major hospital, you have gotten lost. Our goal is that that won't happen. <laughs> um, I think over the years, we have gotten a lot better at that, but they're so, these hospitals are so massive that it's just very, very difficult. Um, we do use color, we use art, we use signage, we use flooring, we use ceilings, we use panels on the wall, we use all these visual cues to help make it easier for somebody in a stressful environment, they've never been here before, to know where they are going. So if somebody asks at the front desk, where do I go, if you go to the next slide, they can say, you're going to go to G, go down that hallway. And you can look down the hallway and you can see where G is and they'll say, take a right. And you know where you're going without meandering around like, like crazy. Um, another example of that is on the left and using just kind of paint. So you have the, the paint, the, the flooring on the side of the patient room and then the paint on the wall to take you down a corridor that is accessible for patients and their families. So at the end of the day, this is the kind of thing that really gives architects joy is, you know, when they're, they're, their users say that this is the best. They felt like home. They felt welcomed, comforted. I felt a sense of hope. Uh, it's amazing how the design and aesthetics of a place can just can be just as impactful as the people within it. That special sauce didn't just happen. It was created and nurtured here at Chestnut Hill. Um, and that's, you know, that that's very telling that a hospital is more than just a, a cold space to get your blood drawn. So where is this going? Where are we going for architecture and healthcare? So we are starting to see a decanting of ambulatory and secondary care. So anything like exam rooms for um, general exams and physicians, um, imaging, things like that are being decanted from hospitals because they're trying to reach a wider range of patients um, and it's just not necessary to be in a hospital. Um, the greater integration in communities, they're really trying to move into these, these areas where their patients actually are and have a greater impact on their life, not just in going to the doctor's office, but, you know, they'll, they want to be able to hold 
uh, wellness classes or yoga classes or um, they're you know teaching kitchens to help you eat better if you have food allergies. So they're really trying to integrate into your life as well to make um, health holistic. Uh, we've seen an increase in emergency departments and cancer uh, treatment facilities. Um, the older the population gets, the, the more cancer patients we see. That's just the reality of it right now until we cure it. Um, and then emergency departments are just, we just need them. So, uh, we have seen a decrease in inpatient beds um, overall, but the major hospitals in cities that are like cramped and tight, um, they're seeing a decoupling of their shared inpatient rooms um, into single rooms. So their numbers are while they're decreasing, they're also trying to recapture those lost beds that are really vital to keeping them running. And then at-home care is on the rise. Uh, we do talk about telehealth a lot, but it's not applicable for all situations. So I just, it, it, the hospital and the exam rooms will never fully go away. Thanks, Bailey. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of continuing on the what's, what's next, what's the future? Um, I think the pandemic has really revealed a focus on resiliency and the importance that healthcare facilities play in the resiliency of a society and communities. Um, so yes, we think about it from the perspective of a pandemic and how do the hospitals respond. Um, one of the images here is, you know, some of the spaces that were created because the thought was the hospitals might not be able to fully respond, what they may not have the capacity to deal with the number of, the amount of illness that was in the community. And so we had to look for alternative spaces to um, deal with that. Um, but it also extends to thinking about what happens when, you know, because of a natural disaster, um, you know, the hospital is not accessible, what that does to a community, a project I'm very familiar with. Norwood Hospital flooded in 2020 and has been closed since then because of the damage that happened in that flood. So what does, you know, that impact in the middle of a pandemic add on the larger community that suddenly lost its hospital? Um, also thinking about, you know, when there is a natural disaster that maybe the hospital is able to stay up and running, but um, it becomes the place that people rely on. They, you know, obviously there's more injury, there's more um, illness that happens because of those disasters, but also that might be the only place that has, you know, access to power, access to food. Um, and so people, it becomes this place of refuge for the community and it needs to be able to take that extra demand on and deal with that. Um, we also saw in really horribly in a number of like major national disasters such as Hurricane Katrina, how the extended length of need that was required and the lack of resources to get those hospitals fully up and running the way they needed to be. Um, you saw really terrible choices need to be made and they weren't able to take care of as many patients as they wanted to in a lot of places. So thinking about how we, we do a better job going forward as we design hospitals to make them stronger and more able to come back and running quickly. Um, but also things like more acute events. So thinking things like a, a mass shooting. So this is from the Boston Marathon bombing, but these mass casualty events, while they're not stretched out like a hurricane might be, there is still this massive demand suddenly that all of the hospitals in the area need to take on and they need to be able to respond efficiently and safely take care of a much larger care patients than their typical volume might require them to take. So all of these pieces are influence how we design our healthcare spaces and think about beyond just the day-to-day, -day, but sort of these unique events. Um, and the FDI has kind of written out kind of requirements or suggestions for how hospitals might do this. And we are, right now, they're basically recommendations, but in the future, more and more of these things will become part of the requirements that we are expecting to have. So we need to begin to, you know, work with our facilities to incorporate more and more of this resiliency in their design. Um, kind of extending beyond just the hospital and just thinking about the resiliency of the community and the community health, um, kind of going back to the value-based care of wanting to have people need less health care, um, is thinking about all of the factors that go into the health of a population and people. And one way we think about that is the social determinants of health. And that's really thinking from, you know, how housing, access to safe um, housing, education level, income, uh, access to food, you know, thinking about food deserts in many communities and there may not be healthy choices. 
Um, other, you know, environmental factors, you know, if you're near a really, you know, a factory pumping off terrible fumes, if your water, you know, think of Flint, Michigan is poisonous. What does that do to the health of the community beyond just what the healthcare space is? Um, um, so, and more and more, we're also seeing that the, as we're moving to value-based care, the healthcare facilities and systems are being required to address social determinants of health, even if they only have limited availability. I think there's some really great benefits for this, but it's also putting pressure on our healthcare systems. And there needs to be more partnership with governmental agencies, other agencies to be addressing these things because you know, a hospital can't fix all of these things by themselves. It's not really in their purview or, and they're not necessarily getting paid for it either. Um, so some of the things that we're seeing that are working towards rethinking our healthcare space um, in the future, a lot of it's relying on technology. So one thing, and we've touched on this before, is thinking about what needs to be in a physical space, a physical building, and what can happen outside of it. So both where the patient is and um, can they be getting care virtually? Are there remote monitoring systems that can track their vital signs if they have a chronic condition and report back to their physicians? They don't need to go in for you know, a lab piece of lab work or um, testing every time they need to get checked up. Um, and also thinking about even if they do come in, um, does all of the people taking care of them need to be at the place that they're going to? They, do they need to come in and, you know, everyone needs to check them, they need to go to a bunch of different doctors, or can those things be virtually managed? So, especially if you're thinking about maybe a remote location that only has a few doctors, is there a specialist that can be called in? Is there another service that can provide, help provide care? So we're looking at how that technology can be built, begin to build um, that care system. Um, the other piece of this is once you're in a clinic, um, how does changes in technology impact um, the care model and the spaces we need to provide. Um, do we need, do we still need waiting rooms? Can people do all of their check-in, do all of that administrative work before they arrive at the door, do it on their phone? Can they get a room assignment? You know, I think some people have probably experienced this at hotels that you can basically say, oh, you need to go to this room. You walk in the door, you go to the room, your doctor meets you there. Um, once again, those remote monitoring, the vitals, do those need to happen? Check out billing. All of these pieces may be able to condense our healthcare space to the real clinical requirements and pull it, pull some of those extra functions out of the healthcare environment. We're not there yet, but I think we're seeing moves towards this. Um, but with that, we also need to think about, does this work for all patients? I think Maley was kind of suggesting this in some way also with home-based care is, there's a digital divide, you know, both um, generationally that not everyone is as comfortable using all forms of technology. There's also thinking about, you know, people who have visual impairment or speech impairment. Some of these technologies may not work and, or they may not have the economic resources to have, you know, a smartphone or have consistent Wi-Fi access to be able to do these pieces. So as we're looking to increase access to people, we also need to think about what are the equity challenges um, to that, and are we providing care to everyone across uh, everyone in need of our of healthcare? So, with that, um, I think what I'm going to pull down the share, but I think what all of us would like to do is kind of just real briefly share why we have um, committed to healthcare design or healthcare as um, as part of our. Right, Oh, sure. Um, yeah, for me, it's, you know, if you're going to be talking about business, why not have it be a business that actually helps people? Uh, although I do sometimes feel a little cruddy that, you know, I'm trying to make money for my clients of, off of people being sick. Um, but I think uh, it, it's more interesting to me than trying to make a chemical company make money. <laughs> um, I think that's a really interesting perspective. And, um, I think I personally really love puzzles and I have a very short attention span. So I think the kind of fundamental like design problem of a healthcare project speaks to me, but sort of beyond my own, you know, um, my own <laughs> focus issues, um, health, healthcare facilities have so much meaning in them. You know, they're meaningful to the people operating them. Um, to the people using them, to the people building them, to the community they they sit within. The, so it's just, it's 
I think it feels so, I guess, benevolent. Um, and that's sort of nice when I'm really stumped by a problem at work or something, you know, it's not, it's not just some sort of superficial, like luxurious architecture problem. It's really, it's usually, you know, it, it's worth, it's worth it. <laughs> so not that any architecture problem isn't worth solving, but it feels more sort of, you know, meaningful to me. So that's why I like healthcare. Um, so I got into healthcare uh, in college. I had a medical event. I had started in engineering and I ended up in one of the hospitals in Boston. And it became very clear to me that while the staff was amazing, the building was really holding them back. Um, I actually didn't even know there was healthcare architecture at the time, but I'm like, I'm done. I'm going to architecture and I switched. Um, and since I have started practicing in this, I have just fallen in love with it. I love puzzles. I love the people that I do my user meetings with. I even, you know, the, the hardest of days, I look at a project sometimes when it's built, I'm like, oh, that could have been better. That couldn't have been better. And then somebody comes along and says, I love this. Thank you. And that's, that just, it means so much to me to be able to do something that is helping at least one person have a better day in a stressful situation. Yeah, kind of building on that, um, I like to think about, you know, healthcare is a type of space that pretty much everyone will interact with at some point in their life. So you're really serving everyone, um, maybe not equally, but you are serving everyone. And you also have to think about all of the kind of impactful moments in one's life that may happen in a healthcare facility. So looking at, you know, you might have a birth of a child, the death of a loved one, a, a, you know, really terrible diagnosis or a really great outcome may all happen in a healthcare space. And while that may not be, the space is probably not the focus of any of those events. If the way we shape that space can make that moment less stressful, more comforting, um, I just think that's a really powerful opportunity to be designing those spaces of those key moments. Um, and secondarily, I just, you get to talk to a lot of really smart people all the time that do things that you don't do at all or really understand. And it's really exciting. I'm constantly learning new things because every project is completely different. Um, and it's just a really fun way to spend the day when you get to kind of pull yourself out of your day-to-day -day working and drawing and figuring out door hardware and getting to talk about kind of these interesting um, new healthcare challenges that people are working through. Yeah. And pharmacists are really funny. Yeah. <laughs> pharmacists are really, really funny. So. <laughs> so with that, I will love to open it up to any questions anyone has and hear if how, do, how we did, if we missed anything, um, if anyone else wants to, that has been Wants to share why they went into healthcare architecture would be great. Mm -hmm. I thought you guys did a, a great job at providing, uh, you know, a broad overview. Um, so, uh, great introduction for those maybe not familiar with the subject. Um, also, just to pick up on Wendy's sort of introductory slides about really how complicated the healthcare system is and, and how many different facets of it there are. I think a, a really interesting backdrop to all of that is the United States spends, outspends per capita per person on healthcare beyond, far beyond any other nation in the world. And, and not necessarily getting any better results. Uh, so, so that's just kind of also an interesting little mm -hmm. thing to think about. Good point. I think it goes to that, those social determinants of health. If you spent more money on making people housed and making sure they have food, you'd probably get better results than just spending more money on treating them once they get sick. Good point, Andrew. I'd like to chime in that you guys did a fabulous job. I just want to um, say kudos to like such a big topic and um, doing a great job showing all the different facets. Um, um, so I just want to say great job. Um, and another 
question or piece I want to add is that a lot of us do healthcare and we have to renovate spaces. I've done this that we've designed. So, you know, <laughs> flexibility, uh, future proofing, I feel like is a big um, challenge or um, topic that clients are looking at these days. And with the pandemic, uh, really the flexibility has been a issue, I think, to plan for surging. And, you know, we I've had projects where they changed all these doubles to singles and now they're like, how do we plan for the surge and bring back the extra cushion for when we run out of bed? So it's like going back and forth. And um, I'll, I'll stop that with that and see what others say about that. I have renovated one of my radiology spaces within five years of building it. So it's you love your projects, but don't get too attached. <laughs> they have to keep updating them to fit code and need and you know so it's it's never going to stop and it's always going to be something new to learn that's why it's so cool did we have a hand up before with that in tom's room <laughs> that was just a clap from the payout crew oh, got it. Yeah. Yeah. Like you enjoyed it <laughs> All right. All right. Well, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So the reason I'm joining the meeting is because like we have we are doing a hospital project and I want to learn the hospital design from the architect's perspective. Mm -hmm. So we can deliver a, like this complex project with good flow and use experience. Mm -hmm. And and like just want to ask you guys one question, like from your perspective. If you want to give one tip for structure engineer, like how do we coordinate with you guys successfully um, to solve this complex puzzle? Invisible skyhook. <laughs> no. no. No cast in place concrete. Yeah. No cast in place concrete. <laughs> 32 foot column grid. That's <laughs> uh, I would also say probably uh, if there's any end you know, mechanical engineers on the call, I think probably they have more complaints than the architects yeah. do about uh, just making sure we're all coordinated for all of the very heavy duty air and mechanical systems that need to get to these rooms um, from a couple of shafts. I do have to say some of my favorite work sessions in the project I just finished were between the HVAC and the structural and us because we had to balance a ring duct system with the structural steel and the windows that we didn't want to have, you know, columns coming through. Um, and it, it took a lot of back and forth, but it, it's, it's going to be really successful. One challenge we noticed like um, for this project, like the structure drawer should come very early before MEP and architecture. And there's a lot of things which hanging on the air and we want to like, mm -hmm. make sure the corner with you guys, get the details, get the factor you guys consider it. For example, the ring leader things. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Very informative coordination is key. <laughs> I think it's it's very informative right presentation. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Okay, so I have a general question. Did, is this, is for those who are in architecture, is this a good presentation to give to younger staff who may be interested but doesn't know um, a lot about it? Is this something that could help them, engage them? Does it give enough information? Is there something that you wish you had seen included? It can go either way from what I saw, and I'm, I'm not young uh, nor an architect. I'm in construction, but it will either really, really energize them and get them excited, or it will scare the <laughs> stuff out of them and, and send them running. But I guess that's what separates the, the successful ones from, from <laughs> those who might not, uh, who might be better in another field. Yeah. I thought it was, I thought it was a great presentation. I think, um, you know, I'd love to see the recording become available. I think it's something, especially for studios and, and yeah. firms that have multiple studios, mm -hmm. you know, people starting out, they're intimidated by healthcare, right? It's so inaccessible. You know, I probably wouldn't have gone into healthcare if I hadn't just made a decision 
when I came out of college and that's all Tiro did. So, um, and it, it ended up being the right decision for me, but a lot of people, you know, that are young in their career, they want to try different things and it can be a little intimidating. And I think that this really made it very accessible. The house analogy, everybody, everybody understands houses. Um, and then just, you know, I think Mally, you did a great job with the, you know, the feel and the design and what design can do to change the care environment. And, you know, it may not necessarily change care outcomes, but, you know, when you're going through those highs and those lows, it can, it can heighten the highs and it can soften the lows. Yeah. Um, and that's a, that's a, that's a big thing to come from the, the built environment. So um, not to discount Andy and, or uh, Andrew and Wendy, but I think those really resonated with the, the staff. I always learn something when I come to a Wendy presentation. That's actually why I came. I was like, oh, Wendy's going to have something good to talk about. So, mm -hmm. and then, you know, the resiliency, mm -hmm. you know, is just really applicable. And so I think it's really well done. Thank you. I agree with Jason as someone freshly out of college. I kind of didn't know what sector I wanted to go into, but I really enjoyed healthcare. So I was kind of thinking about like, this would be a great presentation for like healthcare studios at um, colleges like Endicott or mm. Wentworth or whatever that just as like from a, from in the field, here's a presentation of like how this operates. So. Yeah, I think one thing to be that I found interesting is that I've been doing healthcare work for about 20 years now. And I know there are people that are probably older than me and more experienced in this call and a lot of people that are younger than me, but there are still acronyms. I think Jay was saying earlier, I learn every day, right? You'll come in there and my favorite way to start a meeting is we're going to say a bunch of acronyms and I know you're going to say a bunch of acronyms and everybody's going to be confused at the end of the day, but we got to find a way to get through it. I mean, it just never stops, um, you know, increasing in technology, you never stop learning. And if you're really jazzed about just kind of that continuation of things and not kind of stamping out, not to pick on the K-12 folks, but classrooms after a while, like you will never go to an endo or an OR room. It's the same two years from now as the one you're in. So um, it's a fascinating piece. Yeah, I suggested that they have an acronym slide early on and, and there we go, <laughs> put people to sleep. <laughs> It'd also be like four slides long. <laughs> It'll be 201. We'll do that. <laughs> uh, and the problem with that is they change yeah. institution to institution, discipline to discipline. Like, you know, we've done, you know, three endoscopy projects and meeting with a new endoscopist is a completely different language sometimes that they speak at that institution. Um, you know, some of the things are overlap, but there's still things that you hit the brakes and go, hold on, time out. I have no understanding what you're talking about. Could you please explain that to me? What is that procedure? What is that process? Mm -hmm. um, and that's having just done one for another, you know, medical center. So it's it's really challenging. I think that is that is the obsession with it is that you are constantly drinking from the fire hose. Mm -hmm. um, whether you've been doing this 22 years, 15 minutes, um, there is so much to learn, um, and learning from really smart people. I think. Andrew, you, you nailed that on the head. You're dealing with some of the smartest, most competitive physicians, nurses, practitioners out there. And they just have so much to share with you and giving you those insights into how to design their space. It's, it's really that unpacking that puzzle, um, which is so compelling and so addictive in a good way. Another thing that was really helpful was talking about wayfinding. Because uh, just that's always something that when you're in a hospital, whether you're a patient or someone that's there, trying to find your way is very important. And just making it so that that's a design element is really key. I saw Scott posted something on there earlier about the ACA accreditations. If folks, you know, do decide to get into that. You know, please feel free to reach out to folks that have gone through it. I know Jennifer Alibur actually gave myself and Danielle Buckley is on this call a hand. It's it's a it's a big beast to kind of get into with references and portfolios and there's an exam and all that stuff. And there are people that are totally willing to help you. Um, so please reach out. And I, you know, I appreciate Scott for doing that as well. It's just and same with EDAC. It is a you know EDAC is one of those things that's going to make you think that you've been living your life 
entirely wrong <laughs> and just forgotten all the basic things of how to solve a problem, which mm -hmm. is fascinating because most of us have. These things get so challenging. The mm -hmm. timelines are so fast. You just kind of forget it and try and go right to the end point. Yeah. Um, and the reality is, is you need to slow down and just do the basic things you learn probably in third grade science class, uh, you know, or fourth grade science class, like establishing hypotheses and doing the research. Um, but please feel free to reach out. I'll throw my name in there as well if you have any questions. Um, it's a daunting experience. It, it is a daunting experience, but it, it can be done. Um, and uh, I'm uh, the chair of the certification committee. So I uh, review the portfolios along with the committee members uh, for ACHA certification. So it is a daunting process, but uh, if anybody has any questions about it, please reach out to Jeff or I or anybody else with the ACHA uh, letters behind their name. Uh, I found it interesting working as a sub consultant to learn the constraints on materials and 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 other and constructions in healthcare facilities. And I think there's there's a lot of creativity. Um, that you can use working within those constraints. Mm -hmm. Andrew, I was wondering if we should ask the group um, if, because um, we're looking to get a owner's uh, roundtable around a topic, and if we should poll around that. We had a couple of ideas, um, technology being one. Um, what was the other one? <laughs> Trying to like security was security security. security. Um, so I open it up for people if or any other topic where we're open to ideas. This could be if we pull some clients together. That who? What would you want to hear? Pick their brain about basically. Yeah, I'm wondering if that resilience topic would be useful too. Getting beyond the pandemic part of it, but how do you choose what, how much to invest in that stuff for the 100 year potential of something? You know, one thing that folks aren't aware too, that haven't been this, you know, there's all sorts of organizations too, which would be really great to get involved with, particularly for younger staff, like the, there's NEHIs and England the Healthcare Engineers, Mass, New Hampshire, Maine, Vermont. Any state generally has a chapter and you can get into those meetings and we'll talk about kind of the nuts and bolts stuff, which is fantastic to hear. Um, and they're usually very personal folks. Um, but those things, there's the strategic ones, there's the state hospital associations that meet with. These are all great experiences if you can get in, get your firm to take you to them. Um, you'll learn a ton and just meet with the right people. Mm -hmm. That might be a great group to bring involved or try and incorporate one of these meetings to those. All right, well. I think oh, one other idea, Andrew, is just infection control. I think that's another good group. I always learn a ton when yeah. uh, infection control directors show up to user group meetings. Um, and it's always changing again, like what either from the cleaning materials, what's it like, to you know bands on fabrics that you know pop in um and so i think especially getting you know one or two like different you know, opinions from a couple of the different hospitals maybe to come in and talk to the group about that i think that would be a really compelling conversation and something that um you know i think is another of those design elements it's just, it's not a it's not a um a restriction but it's another it's another puzzle to solve and it's another way to get creative in how you design patient spaces and treatment spaces and, and support space based on those those thoughts and construction, so. They do always surprise you. <laughs> yeah, as to what's important and what's not, like, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> we disagree very strongly with whatever you were just told by the nursing staff, so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, technology is another big one. I think um, AV integration. You know, if you're if you're working in some of the more advanced spaces for procedural and the impact of, you know, uh, what's the right word for it? But you know, broadcasting, right? So they're they're doing broadcasting of procedures, 
Um, we're talking to a couple and they actually want to broadcast to manufacturers to teach them how they actually use their scopes or their stents. And they want to be able to bring the science and tech like the Boston site crew into the procedure room and say, hey, here's what we're doing. Like, can you make this better and do that live instead of over a cadaver or do something else over that? And so I think there's some real big challenges on that. And, you know, kind of pitching it up to this group to get better at that up front because it is always a big change order. I can think back to even when we were doing St. Francis in 2007, Black Diamond came in and, you know, it was always at the 11th hour. They, they delay the decision as long as possible. And there's so much infrastructure that goes into making an integrated procedure room, whether it's OR, endoscopy, whatever. Um, it really is one of those building blocks that knowing a little bit about it, going into it helps. It's not gonna solve all your problems, but it'd yeah. be another good topic. Technology is a very deep one. You, I mean, you have the whole outpatient potential like self-rooming and you have telehealth um, inpatient side, you have, you know, patient um, tracking and staff tracking. You have, you have so much uh, automation potential. Um, so technology seems to be a really deep topic that we could get a lot of different um, topics, many topics around, you know, robotics, uh, food, even down to food delivery, being little machines that go around the. <laughs> so, um, could be a really good topic for a lot of uh, owners and clients to chime in about. Mm -hmm. okay. Telehealth would be a good one again too, because there's so much unknown about it and where it's going to go and how everybody's responded to it differently, mm -hmm. um, and how the how the physicians feel about it, how they want their days scheduled. You know, they don't want it as a block. Like you talk to the physicians a couple of times, we've done it to try to deal with programming and things like that. And they're like, no, I don't want to sit in my house and do televisits all day. Like I want to, I want it to be my no-shows. Like when I have a no-show, I want to be able to jump and see a couple of patients and on that demand queue, um, which is some really interesting things. And I think if this group, you know, came and shared even our own personal experiences with a client or two, that would be a really great opportunity to learn um, and better inform our clients of what, what other people are doing and kind of get a broader net across that. Sorry, I cut you off, Wendy. Oh, no, I was just doing this since I was looking at the time to say, good to see everybody. <laughs> yeah, <so. laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for engaging in a great discussion at the end. It was awesome. Um, and I hope all of you will continue to attend uh, future meetings. Um, I think we're looking, we're trying to schedule a tour right now. So um, we'll let you know once we get that all set up. But um, once again, if you um, want to be making sure you're getting emails and invitations to things, please reach out to one of us um, and, or sign up for follow up from LinkedIn so that we can uh, get you on the list. Great job. Great weekend, everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.